Thank you very much. It's funny, uh, just a few weeks ago, there was a tattoo expo in Moncton, and I got a tattoo of a bee. I didn't even realize that. I was like, okay, so it's going to make sense now. Um, thank you for having me. And I was just talking to Andrew, and we were saying how there's a common thread that's going through all the stories that you hear today. And it is my hope that that kind of gets summed up in today, in, in my talk. So um, here we go. The year was 1999, and I was walking across the stage earning my high school diploma. And in that moment, I looked back and I thought, wow, I'm pretty average. Average grades, didn't really excel at anything. I tried out for the basketball team in my high school and I got cut because I couldn't shoot. I couldn't really dribble. I just had height, that's all I had. But that's not, that doesn't make me anything. Even academically, just 70s and 80s all the way through. And that feeling, that averageness kind of carried on as I went on throughout my life. And I thought, is this, is this all I'm going to be is average? Fast forward the next year, and I was blessed with being able to go to university. I went to UNB, and I had a, a decision. What I talked about earlier was, what I was describing was Kevin version 1.0. And I liked um, her, when she was talking about her versions of herself as well. It's common threads. And in university, nobody knew me there. I got to go to residence, and I lived in McKenzie House, and I looked around, and nobody knew me. So I got to make the decision or the choice to be somebody different. Because in high school, putting me in front of a classroom or in front of people, forget about it. I was the shy, quiet, reserved. I did not want to be seen whatsoever. Put me in the back of the class, head against the wall, and just do stuff, right? But then when I got to university, I wanted to be something different. I wanted to be somebody different. And so I had that opportunity. So I decided to be outgoing, to be out there, to talk to people, to make new friends. And so much so that at the end of my first year, I decided to run for the, um, the council of our house, of our, our residence. So I ran to become the president of Mackenzie House. And I'm sure you've heard the expression, if you're nervous before you talk to a crowd, just picture everyone in their <laughs> underwear, right? Picture everybody in their underwear, or naked. <laughs> so when I, when I was doing my presidential speech, I came out, I had a robe on and I flipped the script and I took my robe off and I did my speech in my underwear. <laughs> that Kevin 2.0 is the complete opposite of Kevin 1.0 who didn't want to be in front of a crowd and now I'm standing in front of over 100 people in my briefs. I ended up winning by the way so it ended up paying off. It was all for, it was all for, for good, not for nothing. And so throughout the years, um, I became a phys ed teacher. I was a teacher in District 2 for, for five years. And while I was teaching, I discovered, or it was brought to me, this concept of CrossFit. And that was kind of a, fitness was a missing piece for me. I knew about sports and activities and all that, but I wasn't really a fitness guy. I, I never had a gym membership in my whole life. And... I started doing CrossFit on my own, and then I introduced it to my students, and then I started an intramural program where they could come down to the, the gymnasium at lunch, and teachers and staff would come down, and I'd put them through CrossFit workouts. And this is Kevin 3.0. I had such a love of fitness that I wanted to tell and expose as many people as I could to this wonderful thing that I've discovered. And eventually I started my own gym, CrossFit Moncton. And that was over 15 years ago now. People would come, I started actually in a school playground. We would meet, 
after work. It was kind of getting dark at the time. And I'd put people through workouts. And I think over the course of that summer, there was about 78 people that came through. And I was trying to express my love of CrossFit with them. And then it got dark and very cold. And so we had to find an indoor location where eventually we started an actual, there was a building. We had a door and a lock. And it was really cool. And I trained people for many years. And they got good results, but not as good as they were hoping. And there was something that was missing. And I discovered that missing thing was nutrition. So then I dove head first into nutrition, precision nutrition level one, level two. I consumed as much nutrition information as I could. And people got amazing results. They were shedding fat, they were gaining muscle faster than ever before because I had combined my love of fitness of CrossFit and nutrition, amazing results. But it wasn't lasting. The results weren't lasting. What is the issue? Why can't they stick with it? And that came to the mindset component. And as my intro mentioned, I believe that those are the three pillars of resiliency. It's kind of like a three-legged table. You need to be balanced in both fitness, nutrition, and mindset in order to have a balanced table. You could have solid mindset, great nutrition, but if you can't get up off the ground when you fall, that's not resilient. So you really need the balance in all three. And that mindset journey took me on this amazing journey, really recently, within the last year or two. Um, again, dove head first into mindset courses, and one that came up was called Enlifted. I was doing it, or I signed up for it, to help my clients change their lives, and little did I know it was gonna change mine. And I'm gonna share that with you today. So the definition, what is mindset? If you look it up in the dictionary, this is what it tells you. It's a person's state of mind. Raise your hand if you know what a circular definition is. <laughs> yes, it's where you use the word to describe the word that you're describing. I don't like this. This is a terrible definition. It's, we can actually break this word down as well. Think about this, mind set, flip it, set mind. If something is set, what do you think of? Cement. Cement. It's solid. It's a foundation. It doesn't move. That's not what mindset is. Our mindset, do you have the same mindset that you had when you were six? I hope not. <laughs> I mean, some of us might when we're playing with our six-year-olds, but no. Your mindset has evolved and changed, and it will continue to evolve and change. I'm just gonna show you how to do that practically when you want it to. Just like I had the opportunity when I wanted to when I was in university. So here's my definition of, well, this is, these are all the same words, by the way. So when we talk about mindset, we're talking about identity, we're also talking about your story. So if you say or you hear people say, I have a bad mindset, what they're really saying is that they have a bad story or they have a bad identity. These are all interchangeable words, okay? So my definition of mindset is the story that you tell yourself to yourself about yourself. And you have the ability to change that story because you have before and you can do it again. Are we in agreement with that? Thumbs up if you agree. Perfect, so everything else from here on out will make sense, as long as you agree with this premise. So how do you get better at mindset? I'll tell you what it isn't. It isn't downloading a motivational app that pops up on your phone every morning at 8 a.m. that says, you're awesome. <laughs> That'll make you feel good for about 3.8 seconds, and then the day starts and you're right back into that story you're right back into that identity, and you're right back into that mindset. How do you get better at mindset? It's not reading more books. It's not listening to that one, if I just listen to one more podcast, I'll get that better mindset that I want. So how do you get better? It's your words. What are words? 
There are language. What is language? There's two types of language that we all have. We have internal language and we have external language. What is our internal language? It's our thoughts. We all have thoughts. Raise your hand if you do not have an internal dialogue. There, there is people that don't have that. They can't like talk to themselves. So everybody here has a voice in their head. Perfect. I'm talking to you people then. So we have internal dialogue, which are thoughts, and we have external dialogue, which goes in three categories. What we say, what we write, and what we type. Of those four, so thoughts, speech, writing, and typing, which one is the fastest? Thoughts. How fast is a thought? Faster than the speed of light. How hard is it to change a thought once it's in motion? Next to impossible, but not impossible, okay? They happen very fast. Of the remaining three, which one is the slowest? Writing, unless you're a pinky finger typer. That might be a little bit slower. My mom is that. So writing, so of those, we know that if you have a negative mindset or a negative story or a negative identity, we can slow those thoughts or that language down by writing it out. That's how we change our words. We get it out of our head onto paper. Most people can fix their problems with a pen. Hold up your magic wand. You should all have one, because the tables came with like five or six of them. This is your magic wand, and you have the ability to change your story with this tool. This pen, at times, may feel like it's 700 pounds, and you never want to be able to pick it up. It's, ugh, I don't want to. I don't want to do it. But I assure you, if you do, if you're disciplined enough to pick it up and write those thoughts down, you can change your words, you can change your language, and you can change your mindset. Oh, I love this one. Okay, this is a, uh, there's a common theme. There's a lot of visualization today, so I'm gonna have you guys do the same thing. We're gonna close our eyes. Okay, close your eyes, couple deep breaths. I want you to imagine that you're in your house, and in your house, you're going into the laundry room. You have a washer and dryer there. In front of the dryer, there is a bucket of marbles. You take that bucket of marbles and you put it in your dryer. You close the door to the dryer and you push the on button. Listen, what's happening? <laughs> I broke my dryer. Cool, relax, open your eyes. What images, what emotions, what feelings came up when you imagined that happening? Chaos, what else? Annoying. Annoying, a racket. What about damage? Somebody said, hey, you're gonna break my dryer, right? These individual marbles are the individual thoughts that are in your head. And when you keep them in your head, they are going to cause significant damage, chaos, destruction, and noise unless you push pause and get them out and put them on paper. Because then you have the ability to look at it. Now it's a real thing. It's not just a thing in my head that's been bouncing around for days, months, years, decades. Now you can look at it and say, can I do anything about that? What if the answer is yes? Yes, I can do something about that. What's the next step? Do it, do something about it. What if the answer is no? There's nothing I can do about that. Release it. There's nothing you can do about it. Oh man, I was supposed to go for a, a hike today with my, my three-year-old daughter and it's raining and snowing and everything's closed. Can't do anything about the weather, but I could do what? Something else, right? Get the marbles out of your head. Write them down. We're gonna play a game. You all have a magic wand. Hopefully you have paper. We're gonna scribe here. 
You can write one or two. I'll give you the choice, and I'll only give you, well, I'm short on time here, so uh, I'll give you a few seconds. Write down this sentence. I should, and then fill in the rest. Make it something personal. It could be something professional. It could be something relational. I should drink more water. It's a common one. I should ask for that promotion. I should spend more time with my family. Something that's meaningful for you. Do we all have one? All right. Is it on? Oh, it's on. <laughs> Double mic. Here we go. Would somebody like to share their should statement? Who got it? Who said sure? Perfect. I should prioritize my mental health and take more time doing what I want to do. Perfect. Keep it. We're not done. I do not know how this will ever go. It's always an experiment for me. So, can you say it one more time for me as, as you said it? No I, clapping after that, though. I should prioritize my mental health and take more time off doing what I want to do. Okay. When you say it like that, how does that make you feel? What mo emotions come up for you when you say it that way? I feel a little guilty for taking time off work okay. and not working as much as I should. Okay. But I need to take time for myself. Do you feel that anywhere in your body when you say that? My back. Okay. I don't, I don't, we didn't talk before this. I have no idea what you're going to say. Just met you, Kevin. Just nice met to me. meet you. Okay. <laughs> you can all do the same thing. You all have a feeling or emotion connected to the sentence that you wrote down. Okay? Take your magic wand. Take it out. Cross out the word should. And I want you to put the word could. Should to could. Please reread your sentence for me. I could prioritize my mental health and take more time off doing what I want to do. Did you hear the difference in her tone? Mm -hmm. She said it differently. Yes. What changed? How does it feel to say it that way? It gives myself permission. <sighs> permission. That's a lot different than guilt and shame. Wow. One word flipped the emotion. Just like that. But we're not done. We're just starting. Change the word could, cross that out, put the word can, C-A-N. Ah, she's already nodding her head. You're, you're giving it away. She's up. She's up. <laughs> Here we go. Let's see it. I can prioritize my mental health and take more time off doing what I want to do. Oh, my God. I love it. You're, we're not done. We're, I told you, we're just getting started. <laughs> How did that feel to say? Fabulous. Fabulous. I affirmed it. <laughs> we, will, we went from that feeling of guilt to it feels fabulous. Fabulous. That is a major 180 shift in emotions from changing one sentence or one word in that sentence. Now, we're going to supercharge your sentences. Take that sentence that you just wrote, I can, da, da 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 whatever you filled in, and I want you to put the word because at the end of it. You're going to finish that sentence. I can blank because blank. What is it? Any reason? That pen was put down with conviction. I love it. Tell me, with your magic wand, what did you create? I can prioritize my mental health and take more time off doing what I want to do because I'm worth it and deserve it. How's it feel to add because? It feels good because I know I will do it. Great, excellent. So what are you going to do after you leave here? I'm not going to look at my work phone. Boom! 
We've now changed behavior from changing one word in a sentence and adding the word because. Isn't that powerful? That's really cool, isn't it? Thank you very much for playing. Yeah. Now there's a picture of a photocopier here because there is a little story behind the word because. It's a quick study, I'll, I'll run through it quick. So there was a researcher, she wanted to find out the power of words and what she would do is go to the uh, photocopy room and she would ask to go to the front of the line. Big line, she'd ask to go to the front. When she got to the front, she'd say, hey, do you mind if I jump in front of you to make photocopies? What percentage of people said yes to that request? Take a guess. A lot, of, a lot of answers here. The answer was 63% said yes. I'm sure if it was a Canadian study, it would have been slightly higher, but we don't want to knock our American friends. So, redid that same study, this time giving a reason. Hey, do you mind if I jump in front of you to make copies because I'm running late for work or because I have to get this assignment in right away? What did the yes response rate go to? Uh, thumbs up for higher or thumbs down for lower? There should be a lot of thumbs up. It went to 94% from adding a reason. We added a reason and it jumped 63% to 94%. Here's where it gets crazy. They redid the study one more time. This time, hey, do you mind if I jump in front of you to make copies because I need to make copies? That was the reason. Well, excuse me, but that's the reason that everybody in this line is also here. We're also here to make photocopies. What was the yes response rate to that? 93%. It went down one percentage point. That is the power of the word because. It supercharges whatever comes before it. That's how powerful it can be. So if you have something to do, on your to-do list, put the word because on the end of it. And there's a higher chance that you will actually do it and get it done. If you have children and you put a because with a reason, you can't just use the word because, it's not that magical. <laughs> Clean up your room, why? Because, that's not gonna work. If you give a reason, I'm not saying it's 100%, but the chances are higher that it will get done. <laughs> abracadabra, that's my next tattoo. When you hear the word abracadabra, what comes to mind? Magic. Magic. Did you know that abracadabra is actually Aramaic and translated loosely to, with my words I create? <laughs> Boom, how many minds just exploded there? Abracadabra, with my words I create. Is that not magic? Is that not what magicians do? They create an illusion with their words. It's amazing, abracadabra, with your words you create. And you can create whatever you want if you use the right words. Change should to could, change could to can, add because, bam, powerful. You've now created a different emotion and you've also created a different outcome because she's not gonna look at her work phone after she leaves here today. It's powerful stuff. RAS, I have to update this picture because we don't have this car anymore, but uh, has anyone here bought a new car recently? What'd you buy? A Subaru, we also bought a Subaru. Now, be, since you bought the Subaru, how many Subarus do you see on the road? You, they're everywhere. You can't not see them, right? When you buy that new car, that's all you see on the road. They were always there. Everybody didn't buy it the same day that you did. They were always there, but now you notice them. That's this, your reticular activating system. It's your brain's editing software and it edits out things that don't matter and it shines a big spotlight on the things that do matter. Remember the book, The Secret? Yep. This is it. This is it. When you look for positivity, what are you most likely to find? 
Positivity. When you highlight certain words in your language, you're going to notice more things and you're going to have a different outcome. This is our last game and this is your homework. I want you to write these words down, but there's a catch. Write down these words on a new sheet of paper, if you have it, bigger than what you would normally write. So I see all your little tiny chicken scratches on your paper, that doesn't count. Make it big. Write it with your left hand. Whatever. Make it big, okay? This is important. Why writing it bigger? Why, why does that even matter? It's gonna stand out. You're gonna activate your reticular activating system because it's something different. It's not gonna blend in. How many, how many um, billboards did you see on the way in today? You don't remember. You, you maybe notice them, but you don't remember what was on all of them because they all blend in. When you write something bigger, it's going to stick out and you're more likely to remember it. Once you have those written down, we're gonna play with these words. Rachel, you wanna do the first one? Uh, yes, you do. Probably. Yeah, I was just looking for probably. No, 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 we're gonna the take these. These are our example sentences. Take this first one, say it for me. I might make that sale. How does it feel to say that? Uh, it's not happening. Why? But you said, it says it right there, that you might make it. Might's not definitive. Wow, that's, that's terrible. What do all of these words have in common? Non-committal, right? That's why we call them soft talk. What's the opposite of soft talk? Solid talk. It's solid. Yeah, close. Hard talk, that's what you have with your kid when they're about to have sex. We don't want to have that hard talk. I'm not here to tell about that. It's soft talk and solid talk. We want it to be solid. So, let's play with this sentence and let's take out the soft talk word. Okay. Go ahead, say it out loud. I make that sale. How does it feel to say that? Perfect. Why? Because it, I will make that sale. You're, you're confirming it. I make that sale. I give that speech. I get what I ask for. It's awesome. That's solid talk. I get, I will, I have. Who would like to go do the, the second one here? Terry Ann, go for it. I should probably go to the gym. Ah, how's it feel to say that? Probably not gonna happen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Gross, right? So let's, let's do this, let's do one at a time. Let's take out probably and re-say the sentence. I should go to the gym. How's it feel? It, I don't like being told what to do. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe a little bit better, a little bit. Right? Get, get rid of the should and probably now. I go to gym. <laughs> the gym. You forgot the the. It's there. It's there. It's a long day. It's been long. She was locked in a closet earlier. She's still not sure where she is. It's okay. It's all right. We're good. I go to the gym. How solid does that sound? Way different. Have you used any of these when talking to friends, colleagues, spouses, children? A lot of the time, right? It does not exude confidence, it does not exude control, it does not exude soli solidness. Like there's, not, there's nothing solid about it. I guess I could try to eat better. Oh, that's got three of them in there. That makes me wanna throw up. Right? I guess I could try to eat better. I don't believe a word of that if anybody told that to me. And trust me, I've heard all of these. When people come into my office and they wanna f work on their nutrition, this is what I hear. And then we play with the words. I heard what you just said, let's write that down. Let's look at these words. Th these are posted in my office. Big, bright letters, you can't miss it. It's funny, when I posted this at my house, it's in my kitchen, and my daughter would say, hey, uh, can we go for a bike ride later? And I'd say, maybe. And she'd go, nah, it's on the list. You can't, you can't say that. She got me, right? So then what did I say? 
we will talk about it later. (laughs) And then guess what she did? She held me to that and we talked about it later and then we ended up going for a bike ride, right? So that's how it works. Any questions on soft talk? Your challenge or your homework is to have this posted somewhere that you're going to see it daily for the next seven days. It could be at work, in your office, it could be on your bathroom mirror, could be in your kitchen, wherever you're most likely to see it, post it there. Because what you're gonna notice is that you're gonna notice when you type and write these things. You may notice when you say it, it's unlikely you'll notice it when you think it, because we know thoughts are really fast. But you will notice it when you type it and when you write it. And the last time I gave this speech, a guy came up to me afterwards at at the lunch break, and he goes, I was writing an email to somebody at work, and I noticed there were three soft talk words in my email. And I just went and got rid of them, and it changed the entire vibe of that email. (laughs) Boom, I love it. One woman that I work with told me that taking these words out just made her an extra $20,000 the next week. She goes, it changes our whole company culture when none of us use these words because shit gets done. It's solid. And you can change your relationships. You can change your, your personal outlook on life when you eliminate these words from your vocabulary. You'll notice it in other people. When other people are talking, you're gonna hear these now because you've noticed them. Your RAS is firing. Don't call them out on it because they weren't here. They won't understand yet, right? You can tell them about it, but don't say, oh, you can't say that, because Kevin told you to, right? That's not how that works. In summation, when you choose your words, you can improve your mindset. Thank you very much for listening. I'll be around for any questions.